Welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. You want to pay attention today, especially if you value education, because the nonprofit I've got coming on today has got a, an amazing educational opportunity that you do not want to miss. Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. So, Tank, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Keith. Great to be here. I'm glad to have you on here, and I'm super excited to talk about this because I, I meant what I just said there in the opening. Like, people do not want to miss this opportunity. Um, I my mind was blown when when we originally talked. For the first time, you in a group Zoom chat kind of mentioned this. I was like, "Whoa, this is interesting!" Like, I've never heard of anything like this. And started looking into it, and I was like, "Hey, we got to talk." And then. Once I got access to the system, I was, my mind was absolutely blown. Yeah. But before we get too far down the rabbit hole with that, tell us a little bit about your your background and your military story. All right. Yeah, happy to. So I'm a 21-year retired Air Force pilot. Uh, I'm a YouTube pilot by trade. Um, so uh, Intel, so very much reconnaissance uh, guy, Intel analyst background. Uh, just kind of working in that field for, for most of my career. The... Uh, Tie that into my last eight years. So I'm uh, retired out of Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California, in Palmdale, California. Um, we are part of LA County. Uh, LA County wants to extradite Palm, the city of Palmdale to Kern County. It's a big battle going on right now because we're not we're not down in the valley, right? Um, so we're in the high desert, and it's called the Animal Valley. Um, so about three thousand foot elevation, uh, super hot during the summers, relatively cold during the winters, uh, but always high winds. But uh, if you ever see the black jets of the Air Force, right, this is this is where they were all built, right here at U.S. Air Force Plant 42 here in Palmdale. So the the dark side of the of the military, you know, exists here. Um, and is that and, what people might refer to as like UFOs or yeah, you know? Absolutely. Okay, I have yeah. figured so. <laughs> yeah, hundred um, percent. So uh, you know the SR seventy one, the F one seventeens, the U twos. Um, any of the new uh, UASs that you see flying around, uh, all that stuff is built right here, uh, developed here, developmental tests exist here. And so I spent the last eight years of my Air Force career uh, working and, and learning this side of the Department of the Defense, uh, not just for the Air Force, but for the, on the, the joint spectrum as, as a whole. So it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, got to network and, and le learn a ton of new things, meet a, a bunch of cool people um, and, and get to touch really cool future weapon systems right we'll just leave it at that now how about the past weapon system is there an sr-71 there uh so there's no no srs are flying anymore i mean we have the blackbird air park you know so i, I mean we go there okay see the sr and the and the and the ox car right the a-17 so the yeah scale. i knew none were flying i just didn't know if there was one there because yeah, I mean, it's such an iconic yeah they're not gonna they, i mean we got the um, SRs, the old U2C models on display. We got F-117s at Edwards Air Force Base on display. Um, all that really cool, like historic, like secret squirrel flying stuff is all is all here, right? And it's it's unknown, which is good because you know people aren't supposed to want to come here, right? Because we want to keep people out for the most part. It's you know keep the prying eyes and ears away from here. Makes sense, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it's. It's important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. the future. So, yeah. but I, I do have to ask, I don't think I've ever asked this question. Where did the nickname come from? Is that, was you, was that your call sign? Yeah. Tank is my okay. call sign. Okay. Wh um, what's the story behind that? There's so, gotta be a good one. Yeah. So I, I told the story on, on the um, vertical momentum podcast with Richard Kaufman. Uh, and basically in the military, a call sign is given and, Nine times out of 10, it's because you did something really insanely stupid or like it was one of those uh-oh moments, you know. Um, there are a few call signs that are tied to people's names because like anybody whose last name is Schmidt, their call sign is usually Messer, right? So for Messer Schmidt, um, and th those are like not too creative, right? So my call sign <laughs> is actually half of drunk tank because I got thrown in a drunk tank um, during my... U2 initial qual training, it was, I, this was one of those moments I thought my Air Force career was done. I was a captain at the time. I'd been, I'd been in, I think I was going on uh, five years in the Air Force, and I was like, great, there goes my career right down, right down the toilet, you know. Uh, thankfully, I, I was able to recover from that. Uh, 
but uh, yeah, so along along with the drunk tank, obviously there comes the events of the night that led up to that. You know, that's that's a long, long drawn out story. Okay, I think we all have one of those. I've, I've yeah. got uh, one myself. Yeah. It did not involve a drunk tank, but it did involve drinking and and police officers. But anyway, yeah, got the got the same same elements to mine, and uh, so it was the only time I pretty much wore my Air Force blues, my dress blues, like for a month straight, walking around the squadron as this new guy. Everyone knows when you're in your blue in your dress uniform more than one day, you did something wrong, right? <laughs> so, so there I was, and then uh, I so I had already soloed in the U two, gone through the basic qual training course. So I was waiting for my mission qual uh, upgrade to start, and I ended up. Uh, uh, so obviously, I'm not flying. You know, everyone's like, "What are we gonna do with this dumbass kid that just got in trouble with the cops?" And lo and behold, like it wasn't actually a big deal. Like it was a I didn't get arrested, right? That that would have been a completely different scenario for me. Um, so I spent the month uh, refurbing, completely overhauling the squadron bar, and everyone loved it. Just absolutely fell in love with it, you know. And I think that uh, helped, you know. Look, I can, this guy's a, he's a great handyman. Look what he did with the bar. Like he gave us new keg, you know, a new kegerator. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> how, how ironic they put you on that task. <laughs> yeah. Like, so oh, you, 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 you get drunk and get in trouble. So we'll just have Don't you remodel the bar. The bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. not the most Air Force shit I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. what, is it with pilots in, what is it with pilots in the bars? Like, I, you know, I, I was security forces. So obviously I tried to stay away from the pilots and, and, and the hangers and stuff. But we yeah. did go into those every now and then. And it did seem like there was a bar in just about every single one I, I went into. Yeah. It, so it's part of the heritage, right? If you look back at the old Army Air Forces day or Army Air Corps days before the Air Force um, segregated, uh, you know, it was it was beers and cigars, right? You look at old pictures, the, you know, everyone knows for the most part who Robin Olds is, uh, one of the most heroic fighter pilots we have. And he had the big bushy mustache, hence mustache march, um, always smoking a cigar, lots of pictures of him standing next to a jet with a, with a bottle of beer, um, it's part of the heritage of growing up, you know, hopefully not doing anything stupid or, or, or dumb, but um, it's, it's part of the culture. Right. And it's hard to let go of that. Um, me being a, a 21 year vet, I saw the transition completely away from the squadron bars for the most part. Right. So the, the, the squadrons that had the lineage tied way, way back. Right. So the ones that weren't started up maybe like in the seventies or eighties, definitely still have their squadron bars. Um, my squadron here, we, we stood up, we reactivated a squadron here at Edwards Air Force Base, got a brand new building completely empty. The first thing we built was a squadron bar. <laughs> like it was hands down a necessity, right? I walked in as a director of operations to the OPSO and I was like, all right, I got it. Office space is over there, hangers over there. This giant space is for the bar. Get to work guys. You know, like we'll build a heritage room, right? Let's put our memories up here. We're starting a brand new squadron. I want pictures taken. I want, you know, coins, I, art ideas for squadron paraphernalia. Put it all up on the walls, you know? And that's how, that's how you record history, right? And that's how you establish that culture, right? So we would debrief and all right, everyone debrief down in the bar, everyone grab a drink, you know, whatever it is, whether it's leaded or unleaded, right? And not alcoholic. Um, grab a drink, let's go debrief, lessons learned, move on with the day. Okay, that makes sense. Good place to do that. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have that perspective as security forces. Yeah, but then again, yeah, we were yeah out driving around shenanigans. <laughs> uh, we just tried to get uh, tried to not get caught sleeping in the in vehicles on the flight line. So yeah. I'm sure you probably saw cops uh, sleeping. Oh in, yeah, in dry, uh, we won't go there. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll just move on with the topic today. So. Um, yeah. So, so you've been with uh, Allegiant Giving. Uh, let me get that scroll in there. Um, so you did your skill bridge with them. So I just wanted to just kind of paint a picture. Now, they don't do this any, uh, anymore, but they kind of started with some action track wheelchairs yeah. Yeah. originally. Then they've gone into some training, uh, mentoring, and different things. But a lot of what they do now is Coursera training for veterans, their spouses, um, skill bridge, and some other things. But um, – We'll start with skill bridge. So they got a five step skill bridge battle plan. Yep. So what explain that to us what that looks like for those who might be interested in skill bridge program. Yeah. So first I, I do want to say, like, I actually um as of 
a couple of weeks ago. I actually don't work for Allegiant Giving anymore. I'm, I'm actively promoting and doing almost all of the same stuff I was doing before um, as I'm transitioning to a, to a different job, a different opportunity. Um, so with the five-step battle plan, if you just think about it uh, from start to finish, the idea is to create, is to start with a mind map of what is it person A wants, right? What do you want to do? Where do you want to vector your life? Where are you trying to go? Are you currently active duty or are you a veteran with a job? And wh where are you looking to transition to, right? So all the intermediary steps um, be before five talk about developing the plan and getting you established on that path with step five being, are you, the question is being asked, you're on the road to success. Are you happy with it? And if not, if you look on the website, the arrow comes back and says, all right, let's reattack step one because Allegiant Giving supports veterans for life. All the services are free. Um, there's never any charge for anything that, that is provided, whether it's the education part, which is the, the biggest program that they have, or the workforce development part, which is basically um, job placement, right? So for SkillBridge, um, as we evolve through all the different branches having their own rules for SkillBridge, uh, as a nonprofit, uh, there is no there's no revenue that comes out of the SkillBridge program or anything. What they what they've done is they've partnered with Coursera and Coursera.org, um, and and have gotten uh, a license essentially to give out un an unlimited number of licenses to anybody who's active duty, a veteran, or a dependent uh, to have access to Coursera. Now there are three things. There are three education modes of Coursera. There's courses, specializations, and then there's accredited uh, classwork. They do not touch the accredited classwork because that's like you'll go on there and you'll see all the universities and colleges that are actually on there providing uh, uh, syllabi courses towards a degree, but you have to actually apply to the university, do all that, and then if you opt to do their program remote, they will then essentially give you a Coursera account to access, you know, Yale's Coursera page or whatever it is. So we do the courses and specializations. There are currently almost 10,000 on there. And just to give you an idea of how, how much Coursera is growing, two years ago, there was only 7,100 courses and specializations offered on there. So in two years, they've gone from essentially 7,000 to just under 10,000, right? And, and if you're wondering, are these legit? Yes. So when you go do a Google Cloud IT certification on there. Coursera hosts the class. You're taking it on the Google servers. Google gives you your certification at the end, right? So when you go through your project management training, there is no, PMI is not associated with Coursera. The project management track is a preparation for you to take the test, right? So once you're done with the Coursera project management course, you're ready to go get your PMI cert, your CAMP cert, um, so construction project management, uh, and, and anything else that, that's in there. But that's a third party. So you go out, you register with PMI Institute, you pay, and then you take the certification. You get the training for free. Of note, as a veteran, though, whenever you take, so if you get Allegiance Coursera set up and you go to take any of these tests, if you go on va.gov and go under their education side, they will also foot the bill for your first attempt at a test. Anything, any subsequent attempt at, if you fail the PMI test, then it's on you. So they will reimburse you for, um, for, for the tests, for any certification, as many as you want, one, one time, right? So you could do PMI. If you had to pay for the Google IT cert, they would pay for that, right? So it's not just a one and done. It's one of each certification that you're looking at taking. So don't, don't lose sight of that reference as well. Yeah, there's an amazing plethora of opportunities there. Like I was, I was telling you before we started, I just got access, oh, maybe like four or five days ago. And when I finally you know, got in, got my account, and I started looking around, I was just blown away. Because yeah. University of Illinois, Michigan, Yale, uh, there was, I think there was a, couple of colleges in, in England, Paris, yep. Copenhagen, I think, a couple in Canada. Yeah, there's hundreds. All across UC Berkeley, UC Irvine, Washington. I mean, it was just like, wow, you know, Google, Meta, mm -hmm. just just about anything you want. There's there's a ton of 
different training tra- I, I guess this leads kind of into my next question the education tracks there's 12 of them maybe maybe another one coming potentially down the line I'm, I'm assuming at the growth rate there's probably maybe even more who, who knows it'll come down the line but yeah there's a ton coming down the line so by the summer i imagine it'll be three or four x as far as the training plans that are put together in the dod required scobridge program office format right to then uh be able to utilize for the Skillbridge program itself. Um, one thing that Allegiant prides itself with, with respect to the Skillbridge program is the application process and how fast it is. So just like what you went through, Keith, as far as filling out the Google form and then engaging once or twice, maybe with somebody from Allegiant to get your access, that's essentially um, outside of a webinar that you have to watch. That's essentially how long it would take any Skillbridger to apply and receive their signed an official training plan for the education track that they pick along with the other document they need to send up with their command, uh, Skillbridge command application, which is the memorandum of participation. Those two documents are needed for any branch, um, any service member in any branch to, to forward on up uh, through their appropriate Skillbridge application channels because all the branches unfortunately have their own application method. Um, the Navy being the most strict um, right now. I mean, should we expect anything different? <laughs> really? I mean, but you know, for those who to back this conversation up, since we're talking about Skillbridge, there's, I imagine, two types of people listening to this: those who've gotten out, you know, and never took advantage of this, or those who are listening to it thinking maybe this works for me. I've heard of the Skillbridge, or maybe I'm thinking about it. What were your experiences? Was it was Skillbridge? What and, and your thoughts? What have you seen from other people too? Yeah. So first, yeah. So what is Skillbridge, right? So co- a congressional mandated pro. It's a congressionally mandated program that allows active duty service members to plan up to 180 days from their official separation date. Any any opportunities they can get to um, to go get an unpaid internship because you're still getting full time active duty pay as a Title Ten federal agent. Uh, to do an employee skills training program, which is education-based, which is like a legion giving. Schedule all your, any other permissive leaves, all your terminal leave and everything. All that has to be scheduled and laid out in a timeline so that it all happens within that 180 day window or less, right? Depending on what you get approved for. Um, and for the active duty service members, it, I, I always recommend to everybody, start your planning two years out, start, um, Giving, providing your leadership with situational awareness that you do plan on using Skillbridge. Everybody should plan on it, whether you get it or not. Remember, because it's Skillbridge is an entitlement; it is not a privilege. Because it's the, when when somebody gets approved for Skillbridge, that unit's um, manning billet, that slot that you fill, it's you don't the commander doesn't get a backfill because you're on permissive uh, permissive TDY or permissive TAD, depending what branch you're in. And you can be recalled at any time if unit mission dictates, right? So you're on the TDY essentially during your skill bridge. Um, so until you hit terminal, they're not allowed to backfill that slot. So they're doing more with less. We're deliberately doing more with less at this point. And uh, so, so just be patient with the process is what I tell everyone. Like, um, and I do want to say this as far as what you put on social media based on what's going on during your skill bridge application, be very, very careful, everybody who are active duty, because your commanders and your supervisors are also on social media. And if you go blasting them because there's a delay with your application or because maybe instead of providing you with 180 days, they say, hey, I can I can give you 120 day skill bridge. You know, dudes and dudettes be happy with that because this is not, it's not, it, it's not a requirement, right? Um, and the DOD is doing what they can right now to help facilitate a better transition for all the active duty service members. And Skillbridge literally in the past maybe year and a half or so has blown up. It has been an unknown, even though it's been active since about 20. So Congress delineated funds for the DOD Skillbridge program back in 2010. They, it, so that got activated around 2014 uh, per the quadrennial, quadrennial uh, finance review and budget reviews. Um, so it's been blowing up. So of course, everybody wants to take part of it. But commands cannot just say, Skillbridge for everybody 180 days, because then there would be no defense, right? Everybody would be on Skillbridge because people are not 
doing more than like six years anymore. Um, oh, you know, and they've got so much turnover every year yeah. that there's so much that leadership has to take into account. And I think you bring up a very good point. I'll, and I'll, I'll throw a word in there. Um, be grateful for what you do get because yeah. I got out in 2011. And so this was not a thing when I got out. And so the generations before now did not have this as an opportunity. So just, you know, if you get 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, be grateful for it. Cause yeah. you're getting something that the generations before you did not get at all. So, you know, just be grateful. It's, it's an amazing thing. I, I would have loved to have had it. I don't know what I would have done, but yeah. it, you, you definitely got a good point. Like it's man over the last year, two years, mm-hmm. definitely over the last three years, this has just exploded. I mean, just, mm-hmm. I think three years ago when I started this podcast, it was one of those things. It was like, okay, what is this skill bridge thing? Like I'm hearing about it, but what is it? There wasn't a whole lot, but now it's just, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. So, and, and the army calls it CSP career skills program. So same thing. So if you go onto the army site to look at how they do the application process, and everything, they, they call it career skills program. Of uh, course. Cause it's, you know, one branch has got to be different than the rest. <laughs> yeah. No, standardization isn't, isn't a thing in the military. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but plan early, be patient and understand the instructions and, and the regulations for your command because they, they will change. The Navy just released NAV admin 064-23023 um, on February 17th that changed uh, the Skillbridge application process completely and added actually a lot of restrictions based on time and service on how long commanders are allowed to authorize uh, skill bridges for. So the younger you are, the longer skill bridge you can have, the, the more senior you are, the shorter the skill bridge you can have. I don't like it, but at this point for the Navy, there should be a lot less back and forth for the personnel on on fighting with the COs or the leaderships on, on trying to get a, a longer skill bridge um, because now they have a solid planning factor. And keep in mind, again, I don't support the NAV admin, but you have a solid planning factor and it's a good place to grow from for the Navy as the DOD will continue to evolve the congressionally mandated rule set, right, instruction set for SkillBridge over time to hopefully uh, implement SkillBridge into a contractual service uh, timeline, right? So basically everybody will get 180 days in the future uh, at some point. Obviously that's probably a couple years out still. Um, once we fix the recruitment and retention problem, right? Uh, for the Navy, unfortunately, if you, if you follow the news, I mean, the hotspots around the world, the Navy is going to be the most active right now, right? So they, they can't let their people go as much in, in today's time. So it's something to think about, um, be aware of that, and just keep in mind, you know, you sign a contract to fulfill X years or however many months you have left in serving active duty, not not being on skill bridge. Yeah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with you. I was going to guess... Uh, cause I wasn't familiar with the, the change to that. I was actually going to guess that it was the opposite of what they did. You know, that the more senior you were, the more time, but I guess I can see why, you know, the longer you've been in, the more skills you've earned, the, 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 yeah. the wiser you are in years, I guess, and experience, I guess what you know, as well as I do, you know, once, once you join the cool kid club and put on the title of veteran, like, it's not really easy. I don't care if you were in five years or 20, like you still, you still have struggles. Like <laughs> I, I don't know that the Navy and their infinite wisdom really realizes that, but you know, I, I guess I get, I get where they're going from and, and you're right. Like, you know, they're definitely going to be projecting power around the world and they, they need to be right now, but hopefully, hopefully it is a long-term thing for all the branches here in a couple of years, because I've been, I've been trying to advocate for that for, for a while because a lot of people don't realize it's the Department of Labor that runs the transition programs, right. and it's not the Department of Defense. And yeah. I, get, I hear a lot of civilians be like, "Wow, you know, why don't they do more for the military?" It's like, well, the Department of Defense does it. Like, when you're done, you're done. Here's your duty two fourteen. Goodbye. Like, it's the Department of Labor that's running those training classes. That's why they tell you to get a LinkedIn profile and dust off your resume or yeah. create a exactly. non-militarized resume. <laughs> you know, it's. So like there's more that could be done. And I think this is something using skill bridge would be a great way somehow. 
I think you'll still have some lost souls that will be out there being like, well, I got 180 days. What am I going to do with it? You know, I don't know how you, you solve that matchmaking, but it gives somebody an opportunity to maybe during that period, go do something else and start getting a taste of civilian life. Maybe take off the uniform, you know, five days a week for work and yeah. get into a different environment and start testing those waters a little bit, you know, and help ease that transition a little bit more. Cause you know what, going to, yeah, we were both air force, you know, the, the taps program were, sitting in that meeting for a week or whatever it is, you know, like that doesn't prepare you. No, it, it doesn't. It's a, it's a, it's a good eye opener. If you, if you can pay attention because it's tough because tap is scheduled for, you know, like anywhere from four to eight hours a day, but everybody knows that humans can only sit in one spot and, and actually pay attention for like 90 minutes. Right. And, and then you're lost. You're like, Oh, do, do, you know, doodling or whatever. So Part of Skillbridge is also incorporating a good Skillbridge company, a good Skillbridge partner will also ensure that not only are they training this active duty person in this new skill, upskilling them in something, but they're going to help them out with the transition. Hey, you, you understand that during active duty service, the DOD just chunked out a, a part of your paycheck for life insurance. Have you thought about new life insurance yet? Wait, what do you mean? I have to go buy my own life insurance? Hey, for your retiree, you have to opt out of the survivor's benefits plan, SBP, right? And it's a whole life or a uniform index life insurance, some weird thing that I didn't know about until I went through TAP and signed the form that you have to get notarized because your wife has to sign it if you're married to opt out. Um, but it's very expensive. And what are the other, what are your other options besides the survivor benefit plan for you on the outside? Well, they don't cover that at all, right? And for those of you watching, just get term life insurance. If you're young, younger, healthy, you're not like sickly or dying, you know, just get term life insurance. It's, it's a standard price for the next 30, 40 years, whatever term you get, um, and you'll save a ton of time money. Uh, and so, you know, it's things like that. Hey, um, when I set up my LinkedIn profile, like, you know, am I, where, where's the best place to go get like a portrait, right? Get a professional photo, right? So there's um, port, uh, portraits for Patriots, right? Is a great service that's free out there. Um, and then how do I optimize my profiles, right? So everyone probably doesn't realize you can go on to, um, uh, I can't think of the name, social, social outposts. I'll, I'll, have, I'll send you the link after this, but how do you, how do you get your one year free LinkedIn premium account, right? As an active duty service member. So you can start networking now. And then how do you be like, what do you, what do you do with that LinkedIn profile? Yeah, Great. You got a profile. What do you do with it? So, so the nice thing about Allegiant is we incorporate all of that knowledge because the current staff and we, right. So I, I obviously just left Allegiant, but the current staff, 90% of them just went through Skillbridge and transitioned and either, you know, they had every, all of us had our ups and downs, right. To include VA processing, right. So for those of you that are getting 180 day skill bridges approved, do you also know that on that 180th day from your separation, you need to be going on to va.gov and filing your BDD, your benefits uh, delivered at discharge intent to file form to set your date for, for your claim at your date of separation. So it will be six months later. And it gives you the number one priority. You become the VA's top priority to deliver a rating, right? upon separation. I got my rating two hours after midnight on the day I separated, which was one October, 2023. Right. Man, let me tell you, you know, <laughs> to just know when or roughly when you might get your rating. Yeah. You'll get it within a week. It is a huge stress reliever. Cause yeah, look, you, if you do it 10 years down the road and you open up a claim, uh, who knows? It'll take you two years to get a rating. Who, yeah. who knows how long? I, yeah. Minimum two years to work through all that. Yeah, I know some people who've gone, you know, gotten lucky and and you know gone through the process and you know six months and yeah, some two years. I, I heard some guy on a on a TikTok the other day saying it took him you know five years to get yeah. one to claim, claim through. You know, I had to keep refiling, got denied, and it's like it could be a pain in the butt. So like, if you know, like, hey, I'm going to have an answer. May may not be the answer you expect or want. But at least you'll have an answer at that at that six month mark. That's huge. Well, the, the, a pro tip for the VA stuff is whether you get the rating number that you want 
0% is a rating. And what you want is anything that you file for as a claim, 0% with everything listed as service connected is gold, is absolute gold for everybody. From that date that you filed your BDD, get the intent to file date established, which is your separation date, you have one year to reattack that all that stuff that you didn't get if you'd like a second or third opinion, right? And you can go to the VA clinic or go do your own insurance. You know, if you're retired, you can use TRICARE for life. If you're not retired and you got a job, go through Blue Cross, Blue Shield, whoever you have and upload everything back to the VA. You have one year to do that, to hit, to get everything reset to that date. So let's say seven months after, after you separate and you went through all these appointments and you filed everything and you got a rating of 60%, they will back pay you that entire time to that date. That's why filing that BDD and establishing that date is so important. Um, so Another thing that's important, that since we're tying this in with skill bridge and the timing of everything, is this also gives you six months or less, whatever, however much time you got. This is your last opportunity to go to your doctor, your primary care doctor, and say and tell them about all the bumps and bruises and scrapes and anything else that you experienced while in uniform boo -boo. to get it on record while you're in service, not yep. a month or so after. Get it tied to when you are in service, tied to a medical record then. So, like that, that's that's important because you wait. 10 years later or something like that, or 15 years later, 20 years down the road, you just can't prove some of that stuff. You know, yeah, like and, and you're not gaming the system when you do this. The problem with the, the issues that come with military service are things that you may not be able to see right now. And the human body is very resilient, honestly, but ailments will, will kind of, kind of fall in, in place as things take time to degrade. Right. So, for example, a lot of ejection seat pilots, right, we have back problems, back issues. Um, I can't tell you how many times I got out of the jet and I'm like, oh, I can't even stand up straight, right? And, and we, when we deployed as U2 guys, we would, you get free chiropractic um, services, right, because we wear the full pressure suit. It's heavy, and it, the human body isn't meant to stay kind of compressed like that. So, you know, you lower lumbar pain, like, oh, everybody has that. Yeah, but you you got it because of your military service. Guess what that lower lumbar pain might turn into later? You got a sore back, you start walking funny. You start walking funny, your knees start going out. Your knees start going out, you start having feet problem. You start, can't you can't reach stuff. All that stuff is tied, right, as a second or third order effect of that primary service-connected disability, right? Ignore the word disability. I hate that. I wish they would just call it a service-connected like ailment. Right? You're not disabled. Um, but document it and, and have it on file because you're a good doctor will see that you have an ailment documented. You go in for something completely different, and they will write a nexus letter to help tie that to something that you already had service-connected. It could be a decade ago, 20 years ago. Um, and then you'll start getting you'll start getting uh, money from the VA to help you compensate for that. Right? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's important to tie those things in. Like, you know, when I, when I was a young airman, got to my first base, they had operational readiness exercises going on. So training was like, we want you out of sight, out of mind. So yeah. a group was getting ready to deploy. So they're like, Hey, these guys are untouchable. They're about to deploy. The, the inspectors are not even going to look at them. So just go hang out with them. So everywhere they went, I went with them. They're doing weapons retention. Yeah. So like some idiot, I should have known better because I've handled weapons my whole life. I'm out there and I'm holding the plastic M9 and I had my thumb out like this for some reason, right? Yeah. So no, no, guy no. comes up like this, goes like this to, to, to take the weapon away from me, goes just like this, right? Man, it hurts so bad. And I'm like, oh, you know, I've jammed a lot of thumbs, you know, fingers over the ear. I'm like, man, that really hurt. And they're like, oh, you know, young airmen just – walk it off, you know, yeah. put me into the baby. And I'm like, no, it freaking hurt. You know, I come in the next day, dude, black and blue, the whole thing, yeah. just swollen black and blue. I know NCOIC of training was like, are you okay? And I'm like, yes, yeah, Sarge, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. He goes, you, you need to go see the doctor. I was like, no, I'm good. I had, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to tough this out. I couldn't even type, dude. I couldn't even move yeah. the thumb. I was, I was like one handed typing. Like, <laughs> It was excruciatingly painful. Yeah. It was just throbbing. It, it was like for a week, you know, and, you know, it subsided. It went by, just took some pain meds, never went to the doctor. And here, you know, 
for for last 10 years like every now and then like my grip gets a little sore like it, yeah. it hurts to grab things and it's like man dude i'm not even 40 yet like and i never it's not documented anywhere like it's just one of those things like i was a young dumb airman that was too prideful to go to the doctor and get it in my records so, so that's a, i'm kind of i'm kind of screwed on that like just so that, things like that like just you know i i could maybe get lucky you know i could maybe get a, a letter one of those guys might be able to track one of those guys down and get a, a nexus letter who knows well a buddy letter right a buddy a letter, yeah example. buddy letter yeah buddy letter that's all you but, need because they don't i mean for the most part people aren't just going to go out and ask their friends to start making up letters right so if, they, if you point. track somebody down from your first base who remembers the incident i mean they're, they're gonna be like oh yeah the, we see this guy was assigned here you guys were on duty at the same time blah, blah, yeah blah. Easier said than done. <laughs> it, it, it is, yeah. But the buddy letter is what will help you tie that that um, service connected it, ailment right uh, to what you have, what what's going on now. Like, let's say you start developing arthritis there sooner than any other joint, right? Guarantee us because you jammed your thumb and didn't get to take care of, right? And you probably have some calcified buildup in there. Blah blah. Oh blah, yeah. Right? I mean, as bad as it was, I probably broke it and, and yeah. never, never. I mean, you know, whatever. Who knows? But. That's why it's important when you're in to like, I don't care if it's an ankle, a thumb, everything. Uh, you, t- you tweak your knee and you just kind of deal with some pain meds until it feels better, but never quite feels right. Like go get those checked out. Like those things that kind of linger, like get it checked out, be an advocate for your own, your own health. And cause you don't know what's going to happen when you, you know, pack on some extra pounds and, and yeah. an extra decade later, like <laughs> yeah. they're going to hurt. You know, there's no doubt about it. It's going to hurt. So but that's 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 some good stuff that everybody should should know going through that yeah. program. There's 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 time there to do those things. Yeah, and, and to close the loop on the skill bridge piece, yeah, we're we're big on that. Like I, I've set up automations, so we use Slack Messenger to communicate with all the skill bridges because there's there's over a thousand in the pipeline right now. And and keep in mind that Allegiant only graduated a hundred and a hundred and forty nine last year. And in January alone there was over 150 people actively enrolled in Skillbridge. So um, the, the, the stuff I did for marketing, that would be a whole different uh, podcast. But uh, the, the automations and the reminders that go out to everybody, everybody has access who's enrolled with us to, to get those automations via Slack or even emails on that are tied to their timelines or reminders like you know don't forget to do this and those go out every week like i was like you know i'm going to set these up to be in overabundance so people see them versus just once a month because then somebody's going to be like oh yeah i remember last month i saw a slack message for something what is it well now they get it every monday tuesday thursday and friday there's slack messages that go out to remind them to do all these things right hey you know we have a, a resume review training coming up you know for free, right? We have a job interview prep resources, like let us know who needs it. Um, well, you know, who needs help with their LinkedIn profile, you know, just email or reach out to so-and-so via Slack and we'll get you on the calendar to, to go over your profile. Um, all that stuff on top of keeping track of where that student is on the training plan schedule, right? For their education track. Um, and then to close the loop in whole at the end, we have a workforce development team. It's still a little immature with the number of partners that Allegiant has to to fl- to kind of flow skill bridges out to companies direct, but just in the past two months alone, it has grown substantially. And when I say substantially, it's not a ton of partners, but the partners we have are the ones who are consistently putting open job regs out that are tied to the skills we teach via the education tracks that are selectable for the skill bridges, right? And that's key. It's not just any open job, which a lot of other skill bridge companies do. Um, we try and place uh, on our on our virtual job board the, the jobs that matter to the skill bridgers because of what they're learning, what they're upskilling in. So, and yeah, that job really, is available for anyone too. It's not just the skill bridgers. I think that's really important. And, and you had told me some of that stuff was kind of in the telecommunications field. Um, yeah. Which, which is huge. You know, I think it was all 5G stuff. I didn't, you know, you didn't say, you know, specifically what company, but, you know, as we look at the cell phone networks around our country and everything's going to 5G, like there's, there's job demand there. Like there is a, 
opportunity there for the next handful of years for gainful employment, advancement, you name it. It's not something that's, you know, it's just a, well, I suppose it's not just a job. There's career opportunities, and not career. just jobs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, get, my, get my words right on that one. Yeah. So it's not just get out and get a job because nobody should get out of the military and just get a job. Cause you know, you did 21 years and I've said this a lot to, to a lot of people. I don't care how long you were in, you still get out and you still have an opportunity to work another at least 15 to 20 years until you're that yeah. typical retirement age. That's a whole another career. That's a yeah. whole another huge chapter in your life. That's not just a job. A job could be part-time work, you know, being a Walmart greeter, like that's a job, yeah. you know, so you, you could do amazing things over a long period of time. That's, that's a career. So there's a lot of opportunity there and a yeah, lot of, absolutely. a lot of training stuff. So I, I highly encourage everybody to, to, to jump on this. I've got to scroll across the bottom for those watching, but I'll have it in the show notes, but how, how can people sign up for every, for all this? So just um, as far as Skillbridge or the free Coursera, the sign up is actually the same method. Uh, so when you go to the homepage, um, you can just scroll down a little. There's a big button that says literally in step one, right? And it says Skillbridge goals slash dream job survey or something like that. So you just click that. It takes you to a Google form, fill out the form. Uh, there's only a very, there's very few um, mandate required fields on there. And uh, I believe it's question five ish. Don't quote me on that right around there. You'll see, you know, what, you know, why are you filling out this form? And you know, you have to, one of two options to select is either Skillbridge or free Coursera. Uh, so obviously for those of you wanting to apply to the Allegiant Skillbridge program, select Skillbridge for those of you that are already past your transition or if you're active duty, not, approaching a transition, you can still get a free Coursera account, then hit free Coursera. You would need to fill out a separate form for your dependents. Uh, that way we can track them and get the information uh, to upload to build their Coursera profile as well. Right. So um, just like Keith did fill one out for your spouse, fill one out for each of your kids and uh, we'll, we'll get them hooked up with a login. Yeah. And, and, you know, that process went really easy. I mean, it's just, I sent everything in, I think it was like a day, maybe two days later, like, mm -hmm. you know, we all just had emails popped up like, Hey, here's your free, free stuff. Just signed in and started looking around. And, uh, if I would have thought about it in advance, I would have had everything. I, I could have pulled it up and shared it right here, had a screen share, oh, but you know, a handful of different, just different types of courses. And you just click on it and you look through And like you said, you had, you know, um, individual courses or like series of courses and a bunch of different things, but just out of curiosity, before we wrap this up, what, uh, since I know you're familiar with quite a few of them in there, I know there's like, you know, 10,000 or so yeah. different courses in there. Is there anything that jumps out to you as some of the most interesting or intriguing trainings offerings, you know, in there? Yeah. Uh, so as we were discussing before, for anybody who's an entrepreneur looking to, maybe bring some efficiency to your business. Uh, I, I really recommend, I have, in my business as a consultant, I push people to learn and understand the Google workspace and the provisions that come with it for the extremely low cost that it comes with. You'll be able to cut out a lot of other usernames and logins because of everything that's included on there. Uh, the course that I signed up for recently, as I told you, I, I just uh, completed a training plan to add to Allegiance um, docket is Meta's AI course as a full stack developer. Um, I think AI uh, is, it. I mean, it's obvious, it's, it's the future, right? But how do we learn it and how do we develop a culture that will promote um, people wanting to jump into AI? Kind of like um, what Raspberry, how Raspberry Pi blew up in the past or even the Python coding language with some of the games that are out there, Minecraft and Roblox. Um, but everybody knows Meta. Everybody likes Facebook. Every, you know, I mean, a third of the population has an Oculus, right? So go out and learn how to make games on that. Or as a as an entrepreneur, go out and learn how to how to do um, Meta ads, right? In 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 the metaverse. Uh, go out, learn how to put market in the metaverse. That is, there's courses for that, right? And while Coursera feeds that to you, you can also um, get all of the meta courses via the Facebook blueprints. Um, for those of you that haven't heard it, Facebook puts all their training out for free. Facebookblueprints.com, I believe you log in with your profile and you get like 
all of their training, how to use a business page effectively. Um, you can do the full stack developer course right from there um, and, and anything that Meta offers. But I like, I'm a tech guy, right? So I will always lean towards something maybe IT, cloud, computing, techie kind of on, on that side. And, and everything's on there. And, and again, as Coursera keeps adding courses, that just lets everybody know that they're adding relevant courses as things change, right? Um, Google Cloud, the Google Cloud IT computing curriculum completely changed. Allegion actually has to adjust their profile, their training plan a little because some of the classes are outdated now. Um, but the nice thing is when you click on Google Cloud IT in Coursera, it gives you the list of your, your syllabus, right? So we essentially just take that copy and put it into a DOD SkillBridge program approved format. And that's that's our training plan. That's what we that's what we send up. So. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff on Google and Meta that are, that are huge, but there's um there's a lot of stuff from like I said earlier, big big name colleges, universities, places you'd never heard of. Mm -hmm. I kind of looked through each one of those uh, different tabs that are on there for the different categories. Yeah. I was just blown away some of the courses. I mean, some of them were like, "Wow, this is useful for business." This one is just just would be interesting knowledge to know. Yeah, you know, and it's it's. And some of it's like, wow, gee, I would never even want to know this, but yeah. this would be interesting. Some of it's like, I would love to know this and it's interesting, but I it don't couldn't use it anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, other other stuff is like, wow, it's like I don't even know where to begin. It's like a kid trying to clean their room. It's like, do I start yeah. with Google? Do I start with Meta? Do I take this business class, that business class? You know, and a lot of them look like uh, looks like a lot of them are set up where it looks like there's some individual classes you might be able to take really quick in a couple of hours. Yeah. And then some of them are, you know, going to be four week or six week, a couple of hours here, you know, each week, it kind of tells you, which is kind of cool. Like, this is how long it's going to take. The instructor's got it set up with like maybe a couple of hours and a couple of readings and, and a couple of quizzes. And then the next week's going to be kind of the same thing in their syllabus. So you kind of know what to expect. Yeah. Um, you don't have the material, but you kind of know what the outline is. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. So I will say this, the Coursera outlines their timelines as if somebody is taking all the classes and they had a full-time job, right? So you will see that like the full stack developer courses for Meta, for Meta AI will say something like one of the courses is like, it's four months, but then you dug down on all the classes and it's like, this module requires you to study for four hours a week, right? So again, they're expecting people to have a full-time job. So what we do is we take that schedule and compress it to 25 hours of classwork a week um, as a SkillBridge partner, you're allowed to task or employ your SkillBridges up to 40 hours per week. So we do 25 hours of classwork and we allocate 15 hours for homework, self-study, testing, and certification, right? Um, which honestly means you're going to have a lot of free time and you can potentially finish your class early. But I, again, the nice thing with Coursera is you can continue to upskill yourself to, to reach your SkillBridge end date, right? Or... If you've got a crazy convoluted VA process going on because you know you're one of the deployed people, maybe like SF guys who go out, you know, for a whole year or like three times in a short career and and you're just hurting, well, go spend time doing your VA stuff, right? Because it's all about the transition picture as a whole, not just the training plan that is assigned by a Legion Giving or by your SkillBridge uh, company. So don't lose sight of that picture. Yeah, it's more than enough time in the week to take care of that and your other other things in life. So yeah. Awesome. Any, any last words for us? Anything else that, we, that we've missed that, that really need to be highlighted? Cause I, I, I will scream this from the mountaintops to every veteran that I meet, like they need to yeah. sign up for this. I, I firmly believe that this is amazing. Great opportunity. Even if somebody just takes one class yeah. or if they do class after class after class, just cause they love, you know, learning stuff. Like there's something for everybody here, but Anything, anything else to add? Yeah, just just one thing for anybody who goes on to AllegiantGiving.org, you'll see up in the header, there's actually, um, Allegiant is a nonprofit, right? So it's tough to continue. We're always seeking ways to fund uh, all the programs that are set up. So I would ask everybody, if you could, um, click on that link in the header to, and make a donation. I mean, any, every dollar counts. We're not looking for giant donations. Um, for those of you that are coming off active duty and you're used to the combined federal campaign stuff where you're doing like a monthly donation, uh, our donation page does allow you to do like a recurring donation of like $10 a month for a year, for example. Right. Um, and 
while those are small donations, you do get the tax benefits from those. But uh, I will foot stomp um, over and over again to everybody like, hey, every dollar counts, um, help us out because we want to keep these provisions going for everybody. Absolutely. Well, Tank, I appreciate you coming on here and sharing with us because this is, once again, like I said, it's mind boggling. People really need to just <laughs> jump on this opportunity. So I appreciate you sharing with us uh, everything that, uh, that you know about Allegiant Giving. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Keith. Yep. It's a pleasure. There you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed. As always, if there's resources that are not on my website that you think should be, please let me know. Uh, the website is battlebuddypodcast.net. And if you are struggling for any reason, please remember the National Suicide Hotline number is 988-PRESS-1.